Well, goodness me, thanks for coming, and uh, and thanks for the online folk. You should have you should have been here, online folk. The um, Palm is gorgeous. The organisation is amazing. We've only got um, 25 minutes to talk about a topic that I think could probably last um, for all eternity. So oh, it's a bit of a narrative wonder, really. So if you don't know me, um, I'm uh, actually I'm a sailor. This is my boat. Um, so I should have come here by boat, really. Um, I've been doing this a very long time. Lovely to see the quote from Steve Jobs. Um, back in 1988, he sponsored my chair as a professor in 1988, and Apple sponsored it. Steve was a great um, supporter of our work. Um, I'm a grandfather and a parent. So my daughter is a head teacher. Of course, like all teachers, she's a superhero. Um, my grandchildren... Um, you know, uh, having the most extraordinary lives, really, this side of COVID. We, I do work in NASA, so they get to play in space. They get to play on the boat. This is an early form of assessment going on here. <laughs> um, I, I'm a professor in UCJC in, in Madrid, and not many universities, I think, have a, have a faculty space that says this. Um, and by the way, if you look at it, you'll see it also includes the School of Health, so, um, you know, fascinating times, really. I'm building schools and spaces all around the world. Here's um, the one we're building in Peru at the moment, in Lima. And it's almost seamless, the difference between inside and outside work. And at the same time, we're running a little beach school on the beach um, near where I live, on the east coast of England. There's no building at all. The kids come and do serious marine biology um, on the beach. So, uh, more of me, just go to my website up, up there, follow me on Twitter. 20, I think 27 million people on the website this year, so there's a lot of interest in all this stuff. I just wanted to start by reminding you how good children are. And I think we've known this for a long time, so I'm just going to dip into a little bit of history. This was... Um, this was a project we ran some years ago called notschool.net. It was a virtual school for children who'd been excluded from school. So they had no school, they had no premises. They wanted to, to, to make a soap opera, you know. They loved uh, watching soaps on television. They had no cameras, no equipment. So they went out and stood on the streets of Chelmsford and acted in front of the security cameras. So they, they'd have fights and chats, and they'd go in, say to the folk inside, Just could we have a copy of your security tape, please? We need it for our, for our soap, you know. Kids are wonderfully ingenious, really, at um, solving problems of resourcing. When we, um, when we built the little Etui robots, here they all are, the, um, the purpose of the robot was to demonstrate that children preschool could do metacognition, could reflect on their own learning. The literature said they couldn't at that point, and... We built these little things, and the kids spend a lot of time designing them with us. And crucially, and when we when we set them loose, the children immediately reflected on, "Oh, silly little robot! That's not how I'd learn." You know, and immediately there was there was metacognition. I took them into a pub um, just outside the city of London, it was full of wealthy bankers. You know, and I had a sack of these little things. They were quite quite cute little little gadgets, and. Um, I just turned them on and put them on the, on the pub floor. Within 10 minutes, the bankers were all down on their knees talking about learning, you know. So it doesn't take much to trigger that, that meta-reflection. When we built the Tesco Schoolnet project, which was um, Guinness Book of Records, biggest learning project in the world, um, 21 million pounds of Tesco's money, every carrier bag in every store had the project on it. But interestingly, when we set the tasks for the kids, um, the same task was set for all children, whether they were five or, or, or right up to 18. And they did the same task, but they did it differently. So we could see very early how powerful that stage, not age, would be. And by the way, just talking to Wayne about this earlier, I mean, um, if you get funding for research projects, 
when you get funding from companies, it's because they're going to learn from us time and time and time again. Education is the, is the learning conduit that companies and all others learn from. And there's Tesco right at the top of the pile. In, this is online retail sales back in 2019. And Tesco, way ahead of the pack because of what they'd learned working so hard with children. And when we set up Teachers TV, um, which was a wonderful thing, uh, you know, thousands of programs for teachers, by teachers. How are they teaching maths in Denmark? You know, the kids would watch it, and these are the numbers. Oh, well, I'm actually breaking the Official Secrets Act here, curiously, because we weren't supposed to tell anyone that children were watching Teachers TV. But look, you know, we are at wits and half term, 432,000 children are heading for half a million watching programs about how to teach by teachers for teachers. They come into school and say, you know, sir, have you, have you seen that program on maths teaching in, um, in Hungary? Would you, would, would, you, would you please watch that program on maths teaching in Hungary because it's going to be better than what we're doing? Um, when we built the Aviva project, we, um, we were worried about examinations and we decided it would be an easy thing to do to give children, and this was right back at the turn of the century, you know, to give children a huge supercomputer to talk to, voice recognition, and to allow them to post the milestones of their learning, and then to do a, a live viva. You know, their phone would ring and they'd be asked questions about, oh, sorry, they'd be asked questions about their learning. Seven schools, four years, we gave the children free reign over the attainment targets that they would achieve, the, the, the outcomes. We gave them everything that they could possibly achieve in the curriculum until they were 18. These were 13 and 14 year olds. We said, you pick the ones you think you're gonna do and then show us you're doing it in four years. Not one child set a target for themselves that was as low as the target set by the curriculum. All of them, in every school, in every year, set themselves higher targets. And because they had this lovely way of being uh, assessed at the end, here's um, little Charlotte doing her exam, sitting on a bed. Um, every single child evidenced every single target. So, you know, it's only four years, it's only seven schools, but it's pretty clear, I think, that education is desperately under-ambitious for children. By the way, of course, we knew it was Charlotte because we had a voice print of every kid, you know, and so there was no hiding place for cheats, you know. Now, suddenly we come to this extraordinary um, pandemic, which is the reason we're all finally back here after a two-year wait. And to my dismay, I found people describing children and their learning as deficient. Uh, now, make no mistake, for some kids, if you're stuck at home, you know, in a one-bedroom flat with an abusive father, it's a terrible place to be locked up for six months. But for many children, that was not the case. They demonstrated an extraordinary resilience that somehow we're familiar with. Here's, um, this was um, Stano, as one of my um, PhD students a while back. He was evacuated during the Second World War. Every day for a fortnight, he went in with a little little badge on saying Stan Owers and his date of birth and a few other details. I'll add one bag each, he had one toy, he took a teddy bear, pair of pyjamas, change of pants, change of socks, that's it. And uh, on the Friday of the second week, they said, oh, you're going to Wales. They all got on the bus and went from East London all the way to Wales, where he spent a considerable amount of time, by the way, looking after his little baby sister. So he became the, he became the parent. And back he came, you know, afterwards. And that generation, the massive disruption of a, of a world war, we might be heading for another, that generation turned out to be the agile minds, the ingenious. They turned out to be John Lennon. They turned out to be Vivian Westwood. They turned out to be Clive Sinclair. They turned out to be the extraordinary post-war generation that, that coped with the magnitude of change, the technology. But look, here's John Lennon's school report, which I love to look at. It's, um, so what were they saying about him? They were saying rather predictably, you know, 
he has many of the wrong ambitions <laughs> and his energy is misplaced, you know. Well, he did all right, didn't he, really? <laughs> so that generation, I think, mirrored the generation we have now. So we put up online a huge um, database. You can go to it, hebel.net golden. And we said to the kids, what have you done that you're proud of during COVID? And you know, not one kid said, we're so proud to have covered the full breadth of the curriculum. I mean, not one kid. Could you believe it? <laughs> well, yeah, you could. <laughs> they went for depth. Over, you know, my little granddaughter's dressed as astronauts. We spent a lot of time making gunpowder, which is quite a lot of fun. Black powder, we blew up a lot of things. We fired rockets up into the air. They sent text messages to the International Space Station, got replies. They talked to NASA about the best plants for your brain and so on, you know. So it's all exciting stuff. And three things emerged, and we've got about 110,000 responses, massive data set of children's attainments. And the one thing that's very clear from all that is that this unique generation um, went for depth, worked with others, they always collaborated, constructivist model of learning says, not just ipsit of referencing, but collegiate and collegiality. And uh, they were always connected with others when they were doing it. So we then get to the point when I wonder what happens when we put that lot back in to the schools that they came out of during COVID. And what happens is they're interested in the data. We built these little boxes. I've got one here in front of me that, that measure the temperature, that measure the humidity, the CO2. Interestingly, the CO2 in here has doubled since you came in. And it's quite well ventilated. Um, measure the TVOCs, that measure the PM 2.5s and so on. And it's really interesting when we give that data. You know, when we say to kids, look, here's the, here's the noise data from your, sorry, here's the noise data from, you know, two classrooms. This is a large, one of those big open plan class. Everybody says they're going to be noisy spaces. I've never seen that in the data. Look, you can follow them. The blue line, kids come in, they all make a lot of noise. Decibels over here, 90 decibels is about the same level as the pit lane in the British Grand Prix, you know, yesterday. But then they quiet down and they're just sort of shouting across the room. Hi, hi, Wayne, how, you, how was your trip? You know, they're just calling around the place. And then they get on with their work and you can see they stay pretty much below 60 decibels, which is a quiet learning murmur. Little bit of a plenary moment before lunch, they go to lunch here. And, um, and same in the afternoon, little bit of a peak. Did you get the school dinner? What was, how was the custard? And then they get on with the work. The traditional class, 27 kids in a room and the door shut. Don't say anything in the morning because there's a seating plan. You know, I've been sitting next to Rachel for, and Dipti on this side. We've been sitting here together for the last two years. We've run out of stuff to say at Christmas. And then as we get towards lunch, we get a little bit turbulent, gets really loud. Teacher shuts them all up and they go to lunch. The school told me they have to go to lunch early because children can't concentrate for a long morning. Yes, they can. Not if you lock them in a cupboard. And then after lunch, you know, noisy, shut up, noisy, shut up, noisy, shut up, noisy, shut up, really noisy, sort of go home. You know, that's the, that's the day of learning. And by the way, you know, if we start looking at things like the levels of CO2 in the classroom, here's um, Alder Grange um, School. Um, and um, uh, you can see they come in in the morning and uh, they start, hopefully they start breathing. And then as we work towards break, CO2 goes up, a little, little dip there. They go out for break. CO2 is a heavy gas. It's a kind of Arnold Schwarzenegger of gases, you know. I'll be back, you know. It just stays there. And then they come back and up it goes. Goes out at lunchtime. After lunch, they had doors and windows open. Didn't get a lot worse, but didn't get a lot better. But if I put on here the line above which you are suboptimal in cognitive terms, it's pretty much the whole day. You know, 1,000 ppm parts per million is about what you're shooting for. The research is pushing that number down maybe lower. Five years ago when we started this, we guessed it was somewhere around 2,000, but it's, it's way down lower than that. 
So these kids come in and they're, they're absolutely red hot for registration, you know. Apple, yes, sir. Oh, blimey, look. So excited. Uh, and that's about your peak, and then after that, you just slip away, you know. And we know that when you give kids that data, the first thing they do is respond to it, and they say, well, hang on, so what if happens if we put a plant wall in? What would happen if we had BYOP, bring your own plants, which is a program we run? And look, here's what happened in Dubai when we put plant wall into, this is Asher Alexander's work in Dubai. She put one of our little learner boxes into 162 classrooms, and here's the data. You know, you don't have to read the details, really. You can if you like, but basically orange is after, blue is before, English, math, science, and then um, academic performance by cohort. Green is after, blue is before. And really interestingly, the data, the subjective data about indiv each individual child, just so look, they fidget less. If you're interested in this stuff, just go to my website, it's all there, and I might tweet some of these uh, images for you as well afterwards, but that's a huge gain. And of course, when we, um, when we think about maybe, uh, ah, here's a slightly scary figure. So this is interesting. This is um, volatile organic compounds, TVOCs, total volatile organic compounds. They're really bad for your brain. You really don't want them to be at any number at all. This is a uh, a school, six o'clock in the morning, and then suddenly the TVOCs literally go through the roof. I'm not, that's clipped because it was, I grabbed it from my phone, and um, yeah, there's another little interesting wrinkle here, isn't it? The, the world of edutech is, is living in landscape, the world of learners is living in portrait, and you know, you try and buy, you try and buy an interactive screen in portrait, so every kid in the class can share their phone on it. Well, nobody's done that. Um, but so this did go down a bit after that, but it never went anywhere near a safe level. What's happening in this classroom is called COVID cleaning. So of course they've, they've dug out industrial strength cleaners and every desk is you know, disinfected with, you know, the classroom is cleaned, the children are brainwashed. I mean, it's disastrous. Now, the more we look at the data, the more interesting it gets. And by the way, you know, if we say to kids, how are we going to fix this? They say, well, why don't we just put a decibel meter in the corner of the classroom? This is um, Hargrave in um, Hargrave Park in Islington. These two guys are in charge of noise today. And if it goes anywhere near the orange, um, they're, they're going to come around and, and shush you down. It's not the teacher's job. You know, these are kids maintaining the quality of their own learning in their own learning spaces with their own technology. And by the way, if they can keep out of the orange all day, they go to lunch five minutes early. So there's a pretty decent incentive. Not as big an incentive as um, Bondi Beach Primary School. I, I do get to work in some pretty cool places, by the way, just, just saying. This is lovely, you know, so they were worried about the noise levels in their canteen. They got architects to come in, fill the place with, um, well, spec up and cost filling the place with, um, you know, um, um, acoustic panelling. But the reality was they couldn't afford it. But the kids' solution was easy. If put a decibel metre behind the serving hatch, if the sound goes up too loud, over 70 decibels, which is quite low, then the price of custard doubles for the rest of the week. And, uh, and, and other things too. It never had to double. The kids were watching. If they saw a hand going up to turn the price list down, the place went quiet. Kids had agency for their own sound, it turned out. Who knew? Well, everybody flipping knew. We just weren't giving, and other places, they just you know, hung umbrellas in the roof to, to capture the sound on the way back down again and a thousand other solutions. So then we started looking in detail at some of the other bits and pieces. I just quit looking at my clock. We started looking at, uh, you know, in, in speed, we started looking at the impact of, of outdoor learning, of you know, here those kids on the beach school, busy, um, you know, with their digital microscopes, bringing them indoors to look at the detail. They capture things in their bug boxes. Here yeah, they are wandering around with their, with their mums and a lot of grandparents, you know, looking at the flora and fauna. These kids know more about the flora and fauna where they live than anybody other than the old fishermen and fisher folk in the town who suddenly now realise how valuable their knowledge is and, 
the kids are chatting at the moment because the jellyfish are five weeks late appearing this year. It's really unusually late. So there's something happening out there. Kids are trekking it, measuring it. You know, it's, um, it's really important because the quality of learning out of doors is fabulous. And if I was to look at movement, it turns out to be really important. Uh, you know, you've all seen, I think, probably the um, Chuck Hillman stuff from Illinois doing functional MRI scans of kids' brains. This is before a test, and so this lot, you know, sit quietly, gather your thoughts, whereas this lot are before the test, just walk around and chat to each other. What you see there is an aggregate of their brain activity. I mean, it's just, this is not rocket science. You know, if your little legs are moving, the blood's pumping around your body, oxygen gets to your head quicker, you think better. Uh, you know, other people in the world are doing things like this. this is Yokohama in Japan, where the kids play in the net above the classroom. This is um, TK Park in, these are all my pictures, I didn't pose these. This is TK Park in Thailand, where the library has a climbing frame up alongside it. This is, um, there are so many of these. I, I'm a great fan of putting um, slides into schools. I, I put slides into schools. Uh, and it's just a lot of fun, you know, the kids, you can see in the top left here, the kids just end a lesson, just jump out of the window, you know, it's, uh, it's, quite, um, it's quite exhilarating, you know. People say, well, what about the staff development? That's really easy, you just have a gin and then jump out of the window. <laughs> it's all very straightforward, you know. And of course, if you go to every Google office in the world, every Google office in the world has a slide because they know how important blood flow is to your brain activity. And we could keep looking at this stuff all day, except we're going to run out of time soonish. So let's just remind ourselves of three things. One is that this is the aggregation of marginal gains. You know, here's the medal table for sport for um, you know Team GB back in 1996 had one gold medal, and that was for rowing. You know, posh sport that not many people do, and. You know, Britain used to be very good at sitting down sports, horse riding, rowing, sailing, Formula One. If you sit down, we were good at it. But, you know, by Rio, 27 gold medals. Here's what we did with uh, hockey. And it's really interesting working, and I work with elite sports. I work with the um, British Olympic team, England rugby, all sorts of people, really football, of course, in Madrid. And that was the space they were learning in before. A dreadful. So we change the CO2 levels, we change the, change the building, we use the floor, all the surfaces are writable. The, the teacher, the coach there, is a bloke, so we've had to, this is taught pedagogy, we had to teach him, put his hands in his pockets and stand back, because blokes always try, try to interfere. So um, he's learned how to be a good coach, and, and those girls in the England and, and the GB um, hockey squad, this is not ice hockey, 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 um, went on to win gold medal in Rio, first time they've been on the podium. Um, you know, learning is incredibly important in all this. So, last few minutes, what do we know? We know that children responding to the data that shows them how good they can be transform their own learning. If you're in the workshop with me later, we're going to look at agency and kids building classrooms in cardboard and a whole host of other things, but, you know, his Thorning School in Silkeborg in Denmark, where one of, the, one of the outcomes the kids were looking for was to be in trouble less with their teachers. And they surveyed, when are we in trouble with our teachers? Mostly it was for running in the school. So when they made over this space, they put in a running lane. If you're on the green bit, you have to run. It's compulsory. Teachers, I've got a lovely picture of their education minister who's actually... She's probably as tubby as me, and she's you know, trying, to, trying to jog along there, keep up with the crowd. But if I then go into the business spaces in, in Madrid, you know, of course, they've got running lanes too because they've learned from the children. And once we realise how much children want to learn, we start turning our attention maybe to their parents. We've been in, uh, in Spain. We've said to the parents, look, You've been kind enough to send your kids to our schools. Um, we'll, we'll support any course you want to do, right up to degree level. You sign up for a course, we'll pay for it. And this is their top 12, top 20 things. Look how diverse it is. Not one parent, by the way, doing a course on better parenting. They want to know about blockchain. They want to know about a million other things. Parents are hugely diverse in their learning 
And you know, so are their kids. So are their kids. What were we doing? Putting them into the certainty of a timetable, the certainty of year groups horizontally structured, the certainty of a room where the desks are all facing the same way, which is, by the way, one of the many things we're doing at the moment is to do, we're modelling the aerosol flow around classrooms. A full wireframe of a variety of different classroom layouts. At this point, I'm reasonably confident to say the most dangerous thing you can do is have them all sitting facing the same way. Because you create an aerosol river that flows straight to the teacher. And you, know, you would expect with forward facing classrooms an unusually high level of COVID infection in teachers. And that was exactly, exactly what we saw during the pandemic. So, what were people doing? Thinking, oh, there's a pandemic. Let's put the kids back into, into rows. The worst thing they could possibly have done. The thing here is nobody looks at the data in detail. Now, all this matters for two reasons. Firstly, we're in a world of computers. And computers are pretty good at these things over here. They're really good at it. That's not to say that kids don't need to remember things. Kids need knowledge above all else, you know. But people are really good at deep knowledge. They're really good at playfulness and adventure. They're really good at, well, you can read the list. Now, the rooms we've built, the spaces we've created, produce kids who are excellent at the list on the left. They will be unemployed. There is no role for them. So where are the spaces that are full of ingenuity and problem solving and collaboration, curiosity and all those other things? And the answer is, and it's a big answer, it's down to you. We're at a point where the world is in crisis. Uh, you know, so many things going wrong. We weren't expecting a war, we weren't expecting climate catastrophe to happen quite as quick. We weren't expecting Trump in, in England, we weren't expecting Boris Johnson, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> How do we cope with that if we've been through a learning system that faces constantly with certainty? The hockey girls have a thing called Thinking Thursday. They come in and it's completely unexpected. They don't know what's going to happen. Just like schools that run Discovery Days. This is a Discovery Day running in Australia. Sorry, the Australian friends are all still jet lagged, but if you're watching this online, you know, hello. Um, and, and look how fabulous it is. Look, the teachers are colour coded. You know, if I'm wearing the yellow hat, I'm managing the day. If I'm wearing the, the red hat, I'm stretching and, and, and um, differentiating. If I'm wearing the blue hat, I'm there to help. Turns out the teachers working, of course, in, uh, in series and teachers working in parallel will work at a very different pace. Three teachers together with three classes together go significantly faster than three teachers in, on their own in three classes. And we know all that. It matters because I'm working in a lot of interesting places. Philippines, Cambodia, Vietnam, just back from Colombia. We're building a beach school on the banks of the uh, Amazon for the indigenous kids in the forest. I do not know a child other than this generation want to go ahead and here's the closing thing, really. Look, here's, here's me in South Africa, little no-no, saying to the, to the conference, um, this is why I've quit my expensive private school and gone back to my school in Soweto, my township school, because the learning there is more grounded in what I'm going to need. Here's, um, here's Brianna giving a really hard time to her um, president in India, and look at this, look at dismay on the face of the poor bloke who's introduced her. She's wagging her finger at him. So there's nothing I did in school that was useful in terms of the world I'm living in, and she's left school to go to Silicon Valley because she was well into quantum computing, and she was in a, she was in a forum about quantum computing, and they hired her before they realized she was a school kid, you know, and, uh, and so on and so forth. We have a generation our golden generation who are up for this and who have not got the patience that we all had to say, well, it will get better, really it will. You know, this is Greta Thunberg's generation. These are the kids who are saying, 
tell you what, you ain't going to put us back in our boxes. We have choices. And the only question for you today is, if you want to save the world, how are you going to give them the freedom to be curious, to be ingenious, to go as fast and as far as they can? And that means stage and age schools. That means every child with their own curriculum, with their own learning journey, with their... We can do this with technology. I get an Uber cab, the driver rates me, I rate the driver. Why aren't children a key part of the assessment process of learning? Well, you know they can be. So, exciting times. I've been a professor a very long time, about 100 years old, but the, the 10 years ahead of us now are going to be the most exciting decade of our lives. The train is leaving the station. The kids are looking out of the window with a big smile on their faces. Education has to decide whether to stay on the platform, see where they go and then follow, or just let's get on the train now and go with them and see if we can't help them to be even better. I'm saying to you now, get on the train, save the world, have a lot of fun doing it. Thank you very much.